Chapters 16 to 20 of Of the Shortness of Life by Lucius Annius Seneca, translated by Aubrey Stewart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Those men lead the shortest and unhappiest lives who forget the past, neglect the present, and dread the future. When they reached the end of it, the poor wretches learned too late that they were busied all their while, that they were doing nothing. You need not think, because sometimes they call for death, that their lives are long. Their folly torments them with vague passions which lead them into the very things of which they are afraid. They often, therefore, wish for death because they live in fear. Neither is it, as you might think, a proof of the length of their lives that they often find the days long that they often complain how slowly the hours pass until the appointed time arrives for dinner. For whenever they are left without their usual business, they fret helplessly in their idleness, and know not how to arrange or to spin it out. They betake themselves, therefore, to some business, and all the intervening time is irksome to them. They would wish by Hercules to skip over it, just as they wish to skip over the intervening days before a gladiatorial contest or some other time appointed for a public spectacle or private indulgence. All postponement of what they wish for is grievous to them, yet the very time which they enjoy is brief and soon past, and is made much briefer by their own fault, for they run from one pleasure to another, and are not able to devote themselves consistently to one passion. Their days are not long, but odious to them. On the other hand, how short they find the nights which they spend with courtesans, or over wine. Hence arises that folly of the poets who encourage the errors of mankind by their myths, and declare that Jupiter, to gratify his voluptuous desires, doubled the length of the night. Is it not adding fuel to our vices, to name the gods as their authors, and to offer our distempers free scope by giving them deity for an example? How can the nights for which men pay so dear fail to appear of the shortest? They lose the day in looking forward to the night, and lose the night through fear of the dawn. Chapter 17 Such men's very pleasures are restless, and disturbed by various alarms, and at the most joyous moment of all there rises the anxious thought, How long will this last? This frame of mind has led kings to weep over their power, and they have not been so much delighted at the grandeur of their position as they have been terrified by the end to which it must some day come. That most arrogant Persian king, when his army stretched over vast plains and could not be counted but only measured, burst into tears at the thought that in less than a hundred years none of all those warriors would be alive, yet their death was brought upon them by the very man who wept over it, who was about to destroy some of them by sea, some on land, some in battle, and some in flight, and who would in a very short space of time put an end to those about whose hundredth year he showed such solicitude. Why need we wonder at their very joys being mixed with fear? They do not rest upon any solid grounds, but are disturbed by the same emptiness from which they spring. What must we suppose to be the misery of such times as even they acknowledge to be wretched? when even the joys by which they elevate themselves and raise themselves above their fellows are of a mixed character. All the greatest blessings are enjoyed with fear, and no thing is so untrustworthy as extreme prosperity. We require fresh strokes of good fortune to enable us to keep that which we are enjoying, and even those of our prayers which are answered require fresh prayers. Everything for which we are dependent on chance is uncertain. The higher it rises, the more opportunities it has of falling. Moreover, no one takes any pleasure in what is about to fall into ruin. Very wretched, therefore, as well as very short, must be the lives of those who work very hard to gain what they must work even harder to keep. They obtain what they wish with infinite labour, and they hold what they have obtained with fear and trembling. Meanwhile, they take no account of time, of which they will never have a fresh and larger supply. They substitute new occupations for old ones. One hope leads to another, one ambition to another, 
They do not seek for an end to their wretchedness, but they change its subject. Do our own preferments trouble us? Nay, those of other men occupy more of our time. Have we ceased from our labours in canvassing? Then we begin others in voting. Have we got rid of the trouble of accusation? Then we begin that of judging. Has a man ceased to be a judge? Then he becomes an examiner. Has he grown old in the salaried management of other people's property? Then he becomes occupied with his own. Marius is discharged from his military service. He becomes counsel many times. Quintius is eager to reach the end of his dictatorship. He will be called a second time from the plough. Scipio marched against the Carthaginians before he was of years sufficient for so great an undertaking. After he has conquered Hannibal, conquered Antiochus, been the glory of his own consulship, and the surety for that of his brother, he might, had he wished it, have been set on the same pedestal with Jupiter. But civil factions will vex the saviour of the state. And he who, when a young man disdained to receive divine honours, will take pride as an old man in obstinately remaining in exile. We shall never lack causes of anxiety, either pleasurable or painful. Our life will be pushed along from one business to another. Leisure will always be wished for, and never enjoyed. Chapter 18 Wherefore, my dearest Paulinus, tear yourself away from the common herd, and since you have seen more rough weather than one would think from your age, betake yourself at length to a more peaceful haven. Reflect what waves you have sailed through, what storms you have endured in private life and brought upon yourself in public. Your courage has been sufficiently displayed by many toilsome and wearisome proofs. Try how it will deal with leisure. The greater, certainly the better part of your life, has been given to your country. Take now some part of your time for yourself as well. I do not urge you to practice a dull or lazy sloth, or to drown all of your fiery spirit in the pleasures which are dear to the herd. That is not rest. You can find greater works than all those which you have hitherto so manfully carried out, upon which you may employ yourself in retirement and security. You manage the revenues of the entire world as unselfishly as though they belonged to another, as laboriously as if they were your own, as scrupulously as though they belonged to the public. You win love in an office in which it is hard to avoid incurring hatred. Yet believe me, it is better to understand your own mind than to understand the corn market. Take away that keen intellect of yours, so well capable of grappling with the greatest subjects, from a post which may be dignified, but which is hardly fitted to render life happy, and reflect that you did not study from childhood all the branches of a liberal education, merely in order that many thousand tons of corn might safely be entrusted to your charge. You have given us promise of something greater and nobler than this. There will never be any want of strict economists or of laborious workers. Slow-going beasts of burden are better suited for carrying loads than well-bred horses whose generous swiftness no one would encumber with a heavy back. Think, moreover, how full of risk is the great task which you have undertaken. You have to deal with the human stomach. The hungry people will not endure reason, will not be appeased by justice, and will not hearken to any prayers. Only just a few days ago, when Caesar perished, grieving for nothing to, so much, if those in the other world can feel grief, as that the Roman people did not die with him. There was said to be only enough corn for seven or eight days' consumption. While he was making bridges with ships, and playing with the resources of the empire, want of provisions, the worst evil that can befall, even the besieged city, was at hand. His imitation of a crazy, outlandish, and misproud king very nearly ended in ruin, famine, and the general revolution which follows famine. What must then have been the feelings of those who had the charge of supplying the city with corn? who were in danger of stoning, of fire and sword, of Gaius himself. With consummate art, they concealed the vast internal evil by which the state was menaced, and were quite right in so doing. For some diseases must be cured without the patient's knowledge. Many have died through discovering what was the matter with them. Chapter 19 
betake yourself to these quieter, safer, larger fields of action. Do you think that there can be any comparison between seeing that corn is deposited in the public yet granary without being stolen by the fraud or spoilt by the carelessness of the importer, that it does not suffer from damp or overheating, and that it measures and weighs as much as it ought, and beginning the study of sacred and divine knowledge, which will teach you of what elements the gods are formed, what are their pleasures, their position, their form, to what changes your soul has to look forward, where nature will place us when we are dismissed from our bodies, what that principle is which holds all the heaviest particles of our universe in the middle, suspends the lighter ones above, puts fire highest of all, and causes the stars to rise in their courses, with many other matters full of marvels. Will you not cease to grovel on earth and turn your mind's eye on these themes? Nay, while your blood still flows swiftly, before your knees grow feeble, you ought to take the better path. In this course of life there await you many good things, such as love and practice of the virtues, forgetfulness of passions, knowledge of how to live and die, deep repose. The position of all busy men is unhappy, but most unhappy of all is that of those who do not even labour at their own affairs, but have to regulate their rest by another man's sleep, their walk by another man's pace, and whose very love and hate, the freest thing in, in the world, are at another's bidding. If such men wish to know how short their lives are, let them think how small a fraction of them is their own. CHAPTER Twenty. When, therefore, you see a man often wear the purple robes of office, and hear his name often repeated in the forum, do not envy him. He gains these things by losing so much of his life. Men throw away all their years in order to have one year named after them as consul. Some lose their lives during the early part of the struggle, and never reach the height to which they aspired. Some, after having submitted to a thousand indignities in order to reach the crowning dignity, have the miserable reflection that the only result of their labours will be the inscription on their tombstone. Some, while telling off extreme old age, like youth, for new aspirations, have found it fail from sheer weakness amid great and presumptuous enterprises. It is a shameful ending when a man's breath deserts him in a court of justice, while, although well stricken in years, he is still striving to gain the sympathies of an ignorant audience for some obscure litigant. It is base to perish in the midst of one's business, wearied with living sooner than with working, shameful too to die in the act of receiving payments amid the laughter of one's long expectant air. I cannot pass over an instance which occurs to me. Tyrannius was an old man of the most painstaking exactitude who after entering upon his ninetieth year, when he had by Caesar's own act been relieved of his duties as collector of the revenue, ordered himself to be laid out on his bed and mourned for as though he were dead. The whole house mourned for the leisure of its old master, and did not lay aside its mourning until his work was restored to him. Can men find such pleasure in dying in harness? Yet many are of the same mind, they retain their wish for labour longer than their capacity for it, and fight against their bodily weakness. They think old age an evil for no other reason than because it lays them on the shelf. The Lord does not enrol a soldier after his fiftieth year, or require a senator's attendance after his sixtieth, but men have more difficulty in obtaining their own consent than that of the law to a life of leisure. Meanwhile, while they are plundering and being plundered, while one is disturbing another's repose, and all are being made wretched alike, life remains without profit, without pleasure, without any intellectual progress. No one keeps death well before his eyes. No one refrains from far-reaching hopes. Some even arrange things which lie beyond their own lives, such as huge sepulchral buildings, the dedication of public works, and exhibitions to be given at their funeral pyre and unstentatious processions, but, by Hercules, the funerals of such men ought to be conducted by the light of torches and wax tapers, as though they had lived but a few days. End of chapter 16 to 20 
End of Of the Shortness of Life by Lucius Annius Seneca Translated by Aubrey Stewart